My name is Jennifer Gray Thompson, and I'm the Executive Director of Rebuild North Bay Foundation. This podcast is specifically designed to bring you people who have been through what maybe you have just gone through or that you are concerned about. We created the podcast, Hide a Disaster, to show you the breadth and depth of humanity in the midst of this really terrible thing that happened. I wanted to do this podcast so that I could bring some of the most amazing leaders that I've ever known in my life to you. You may have just experienced a disaster and you may be looking around and you are dealing with trauma and the shock of it. And you may be wondering, I don't know how to do this part. And so we purposefully made this podcast into different sections and different topics of recovery so that you could pick and choose what would work for you at that time. So welcome to How to Disaster, and thank you for giving us your time. Um, welcome to How to Disaster, the podcast that helps communities recover, rebuild, and reimagine their lives post-disaster. I'm so pleased today to be sitting here with my friend and colleague, uh, Brad Sherwood. Brad Sherwood not only works for the County of Sonoma as a communications and a government affairs director at Sonoma Water, he is also a fire survivor who recently rebuilt his home. Now, Brad has been a leader in the community since day one when this fire occurred, and that's not an easy thing to pull off when you've also just lost everything in a massive wildfire. He took the initiative and led his community out of this incredible, incredibly challenging time through the creation of the Larkfield Resiliency Fund. Now, I like to say that Brad has was the secret sauce, um, the secret ingredient in any ask that comes to rebuild. He came to us about two and a half years ago because we were doing this other project and asked if we could possibly help rebuild a mile of common fencing around his neighborhood and Mark West Estates, which is their neighboring um, neighborhood that was also devastated. And I initially was like, no, I don't wanna do that because I'm not a fence fairy. But because it was Brad that asked and he's um, so very compelling and smart and such a great leader, I had to actually consider it. And there, um, thereafter, it took about a year and a half from beginning to end with all of the uh, fundraising, which took 10 months and then the build of the actual fence, but we did get it done. And if you haven't seen it, we do have a short film on that. Um, it's on our YouTube channel. So please do take a look. Brad has continued to stay in this, uh, in his ad role as an advocate and a wonderful representative of what it means to be a fire survivor. And to this day, when something comes up, he is on the front lines of showing people not only how to recover, but really how to advocate as well. So today I asked Brad to come on and talk to you all about how to organize your community after a disaster, how to stay in the fight even after your home is, is rebuilt, um, and how to successfully advocate at the uh, local and state levels in particular. So welcome, Brad. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to the Rebuild North Bay Foundation and for inviting me on this amazing podcast. This is incredible. Thank you. So what I would love is if you would start by telling us your personal story about um, what, you know, your home, when did you buy your home, your family, and, um, and then how, what happened the night that you lost your home? Sure. So my, uh, my wife and I have uh, two kids. Uh, they are currently eight and 10 years old. We uh, bought our home in Larkfield, just north of Santa Rosa and unincorporated Sonoma County in uh, July 1st of 2013. Uh, this home is, is or was our dream home. It was everything you we ever wanted in a home. It was a, a small ranch style house built in 1972 in a uh, beautiful neighborhood with mature trees, uh, walking distance to the local elementary school, great public schools, just uh, really, you know, our our dream home, dream neighborhood, uh, where we wanted to raise our, our family. Uh, we're both originally from uh, Sacramento, the Sacramento area, and we moved to Sonoma County um, in 2005. And I, I moved to Sonoma County for my job at Sonoma Water, um, great organization, uh, 
great public service to our community. And uh, to this day, I've, I've grown and prospered there and just absolutely love what I do for a living. Uh, my wife works for uh, Medtronic, uh, a large uh, biotech company um, worldwide, and absolutely uh, loves her job and the people she works with. The, um, in 2017, the uh, night of the fire, uh, we were lucky just to survive. Uh, we had no warning, no evacuation notice, and uh, only had minutes to escape our home uh, before the fire destroyed it, along with thousands of others that night. Uh, specifically that night, uh, you know, we pretty much ran out of the house with no shoes on. Uh, we were lucky to grab our pets on the way out, uh, but we lost everything, and uh, we were able to get uh, our lives out, and that's all that matters. Uh, we, we were fortunate that our neighborhood, uh, we, we did somewhat know each other. Um, I mean, obviously, we're not as close. We weren't as close then as we are now. But um, in between the minutes that we had to evacuate from our home, I was able to go and run up and down the street and knock on the doors of lots of our neighbors whom were asleep in bed. So um, it was really at that point of knocking on doors, trying to get people out of their homes that I guess you can say, you know, my involvement in being a fire survivor started because I, I immediately realized that um, A, <clears throat> we're going to rebuild and B, we're going to make this community better and stronger, not just for ourselves, but for our future generations. Which is a huge part of um, advocacy, but how do you do that when you just run for your life, though? I mean, that's, yeah. I think that's one of the questions. That, so if we assume that the audience is often people who either want to build resiliency or they've just undergone this very significant um, life-changing experience, but then to pick yourself up and uh, along the way to pick your community up is a whole different thing. And so you became part of the block captain system, but take, take us in that span of that's a couple weeks time, though. How do you um how do you do that yeah i think uh you know immediately after the fire uh we were in a complete daze i mean um i i as a county employee as an emergency service worker i, I tried to go back into work work the emergency operations center um i did for a few days but then i had to take some time off because my family needed me my kids needed to see me uh, you know, you've just gone through the most traumatic experience of a lifetime. And in learning that people died around you uh, was even more sobering. Um, you can rebuild a house, but you can't bring back those lives. And I think that's when hearing about the lives lost because of the wildfire definitely um, lit a fire within myself. Mm -hmm. I was really upset. I was angry. I was mad. You know, how can we, how, how could we have let these lives, you know, be lost? I mean, what, how can this be in this modern day that we live in? How do we lose lives in a wildfire, especially in an urban suburban setting? Something's wrong. Doesn't make sense. And I think that is where the, my drive and my family's drive to become more involved both in the block captain program and developing a nonprofit for our community and helping others rebuild drives from is, you know, we have gone through this pain and the suffering and I hope we've gone through it so no one else has to. Let's take what we've learned and pay it forward. Let's take what we've gone through and share our experience share our knowledge. That is probably one of the most important traits we as human beings have. Technology aside, we must share experiences to prevent history from repeating itself. And that's, that's my main goal. And first step in achieving that goal is sitting down with your significant other and agreeing that we're in this together, that we're not only going to rebuild our lives and our home, but we're going to help our community. 
And by doing that, that requires a lot of additional time, energy, sweat and tears. Because all of a sudden you're opening yourself up, not just to your own family grieving process, but a community grieving process. We agreed to both my wife and I and our family invest in our community and help our neighborhood rebuild. We were so underinsured that we knew that it would take every penny of our insurance dollars to rebuild our house. And with the way local costs were at the time and continue to be, we couldn't afford to rebuild our home as was. So we worked with our neighborhood and developed a regroup rebuilding project where we brought in one developer who developed a series of floor plans for over 17 homes in our neighborhood and over 85 homes in the Mark West Estates, we as a large group were able to benefit from fixed price housing development. And it's because of that group rebuild effort that many of us were able to rebuild our homes and actually uh, not come out of this financially in the red, uh, but work within our means. And so even with thing. that, I would just like to know, and I hope it's okay for me to say, because you shared it the other day, even with that, you still had to use your contents. Oh, and yeah. Contents are between 40 and 60% of your coverage. And yep. like a lot of rebuilders, you still had to go that route. Absolutely. We, you know, we used every penny of our insurance from the, the dwelling to the non-dwelling to the content bucket, all those funds, those different buckets all went into rebuilding our house. Yeah, majority of the things we have in our homes today are from donations we received after the fire. Yes, but just to be clear, unless people ask for them, don't 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 give them donations. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. Like if someone's like, I need a couch and a table and six chairs, then that's a good, that's a wonderful thing to accept. But um, absolutely, because that, yeah, that not was actually, it was kind of overwhelming right after the fire. Uh, we had a couple, uh, uh, you know, amazing friends and family members who helped coordinate donation drives. And the next thing you knew, uh, we had, uh, you know, storage unit full of donated items. And uh, we were able to, you know, organize those items and help distribute them to other families who needed them. But uh, yeah, donating items has got to be very strategic and definitely coordinate with any kind of local nonprofit or provider in an area that's been devastated by wildfire uh, on those donation services. So I think it's kind of interesting that um, in, in a little bit um, oddly fortuitous that um, our community was really the first one to be this uh, devastated by these mega wildfires um, because I think we share the experience of being really surprised by how little was out there to help us along the way, how I remember very clearly on day one of the fires, you know, being out in my community in Sonoma Valley and, and looking around and being like, okay, I'm going to do absolutely everything I can in the leadership role, but I'm sure that the Calvary is going to show up and then they're going to tell me where to be. And then about day three, I was like, oh, there is no Calvary. Um, right. We are the Calvary for the community. And that has continued to be a lesson, I think, for all of us moving forward is that so many of the systems that we have used to recover and rebuild. Um, we have had to maybe take a kernel of something that was over, over here, over there, but basically create from scratch, which is one of the reasons why um, I wanted to do this podcast. So that the hope is, is to mitigate or shorten the pain period for um, recovery and share those lessons. Can you talk to us about how your experience working in county government helped you be a very good advocate for some of the policies that needed to change or be adapted in order to help people rebuild? Absolutely. I think we had the same kind of realization uh, probably a couple months after the fire that the Calvary wasn't coming and that uh, we were going to have to rebuild on our own. And it's because of partners like Rebuild North Bay Foundation that we were able to rebuild our community and so quickly and in an efficient manner. So 
we had to, within our own community and neighborhood, uh, organize. And we developed a neighborhood website. We developed neighborhood email lists. We were uh, started sending out weekly rebuild updates. We immediately developed a uh, needs list, an assessment needs list. We developed a list to ensure that we could help the County of Sonoma and other government entities know where and how they can help us. I know so many people wanna help during, after a wildfire. Everyone's heart is in the right place. Everyone wants to reach out, they wanna help. How though, how do you help the community? How do you know what they need? That's really the hole that we filled. So I know as a, as a government employee, I know that you, know, you, you have to have a project, you have to have a, a needs, you have to have a, a list. So let's do that. Let's develop that for the government entities and make it easier on them to come help us. So that's essentially what we did. We knew in our neighborhood that we didn't have sewer. We had over almost 200 homes that were all on individual septic tanks pre-fire. Now you had an excellent opportunity to come in and develop a sewer system for these newly rebuilt homes and provide financial assistance to those property owners so they could rebuild within their insurance means, but also take advantage of the modern technology of sewer, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, that's one example where government was able to meet with the community, assess their needs, develop a plan, and then implement. And, and well, really, and part of that was helping them figure out a creative finance model. Absolutely. And a lot of it was really, you know, and this was a time you got to remember when you had a whole community dispersed. I mean, no one obviously lived in our neighborhood. We had neighbors who were, they moved to Colorado, they moved to Texas, they were everywhere. So we implemented a lot of social media, Facebook uh, calls and meetings. And we met with, for example, Sonoma Water and talked to them about our need for sewer. But also we had a huge financial issue. No one can afford it. Who can afford to pay $55,000 out of pocket for sewer when you can't even afford to rebuild your home? Your priority is to rebuild your home. The priority of Sonoma Water was to ensure that we were all able to hook up the sewer if we wanted to. So the board of directors and the board of supervisors approved a remarkable financing program that allowed everyone to connect the sewer if they wanted to, and then they would get a loan from Sonoma Water and they wouldn't have to repay that loan for 20 years. And it was a two and a half percent interest rate at that. So the financing creativity from Sonoma Water in the county of Sonoma was phenomenal in helping uh, rebuild our community. And I think it's because we educated and made sure that government agencies were aware of our situation, each homeowner's situation, and they tailored that program to our needs. Who is Fannie Mae? Fannie Mae is the largest provider of mortgage financing in the United States. We own one out of every four loans in the country. How do I find out if Fannie Mae owns my mortgage? Fannie Mae has a loan lookup tool available at knowyouroptions.com. It's simple to use and will show if we own your mortgage or not. Why does it matter who owns my mortgage? If making your mortgage payments becomes difficult, who owns your mortgage really matters. For those who have mortgages owned by Fannie Mae and are experiencing financial hardships, there are several programs available to help. Today, we are focusing on options for those impacted by a natural disaster, such as a fire, or financial hardship caused by the COVID-19. One of the options available is a forbearance plan. How does that work? A forbearance plan provides the homeowner a period of reduced or suspended payments to manage a temporary financial hardship. For hardship to be caused by a natural disaster or COVID-19, homeowners may be eligible for an initial plan up to six months with the possibility of a six-month extension. During a Fannie Mae forbearance plan, the homeowner is not charged late fees. Do homeowners need to enter into a forbearance plan immediately after a disaster event? No. If you received additional living expense assistance after the disaster event and those funds have run out, you may still be eligible for a forbearance plan. 
What happens when the forbearance plan ends? Your lender or service should contact you during the forbearance plan to see if you still need assistance or are ready to resume making your mortgage payment on completion of the plan. If you don't hear from them, you should proactively reach out to have a next step in place. Once the plan ends, the balance that was reduced or suspended from the mortgage is due. However, if you are unable to repay the balance in its entirety, you may arrange a repayment plan or, if eligible, qualify for other programs such as a payment deferral, flex modification, or another workout. Can you please explain the difference? What is a payment deferral? A payment deferral allows you to bring your mortgage current by delaying or deferring repayment of past due amounts. This option keeps your monthly mortgage payment the same as it was before the hardship. The total deferred amount will be due on the last scheduled payment of the date of the loan. Should you sell or refinance or pay off your home, the deferred balance is included in the total remaining amount due. What about flex modification? Flex modification is Fannie Mae's standard modification program. It strives to provide a 20% principal and interest payment reduction on your mortgage. Once the modification is complete, the loan's term is extended to 40 years. Depending on circumstances, the modification may result in a reduction of interest rate and or principal forbearance to help you achieve the targeted payment reduction. What's a principal forbearance? Principal forbearance is when a portion of the unpaid principal balance, basically the remaining loan amount, is put into an interest-free balance secured by the loan as part of the modification and is due at the modified maturity date or with early payoff. Where can homeowners get more information and assistance? More information is readily available at knowyouroptions.com. When ready to request mortgage assistance, reach out to your mortgage company, also known as a mortgage servicer. This is the company you send your payment to each month. You'll find the phone number on your mortgage statement. Additional relief assistance is available through our Disaster Response Network. Here, impacted owners can work with HUD-approved housing counselors to get help requesting financial relief through FEMA, insurance claims, and more. Homeowners can visit knowyouroptions.com relief for more information or call 877-833-1746. Once again, that is 877-833-1746. Now, some people are going to look at this or listen to this podcast or watch it on YouTube and they're going to say, oh, you know what? They were able to do that um, because Brad was on the inside. And what could an ordinary person like me do who doesn't work for the county government? Like what, you know, what role can an emergent leader play in doing all, you know, in replicating what you were able to accomplish? Um, so what would you say to those people? Well, I would say definitely it, it takes developing relationships with key government officials and your local elected officials. Don't be afraid to invite your local county supervisor, your local assembly member, your local state senator into your neighborhood and hold a community meeting for them, with them. Develop a partnership. This is all about partnerships. This is all about relationship building. It doesn't matter where you work. You're a resident. You're a taxpayer. You're a constituent. And believe it or not, a lot of our, our elected officials do not hear from their constituents every day. Believe it or not, they only hear from constituents when there's an issue or a problem, right? Be that constituent that reaches out and develops a relationship before there's a problem, before there's an issue. Develop that relationship and that trust so that when you do need their help, they trust you, they know you, and they're ready to help you right away. So that's my think, biggest advice. And I think that one thing, if people don't work in the public sector or they have never worked for an elected or worked around electeds, I think that they have this idea that they are not that accessible or that, um, what, and, and what I would also like to note is because um, elected officials and public officials so often only hear when something is wrong and they get screamed at a lot, that it becomes very hard to hear through all of the noise. Of, right. you know, like, what do you actually need? Like, I understand that you're upset, 
but I need to figure out as your representative what you need and how I can help. And when you have worked in the public sector, like I have and like you do, then you understand that if you can present them with a clear path, uh, it makes all the difference in the world. You cannot assume that they are magical thinkers. And Absolutely. in the case, yeah, and in the case of a, of, a, of a huge disaster, they've often undergone the trauma themselves. And what I saw and have seen repeatedly is you have these areas where you've had these massive disasters and then everyone looks to the public sector to um, be the recipient of their grief and their fear and their upset, but also to continue to fix whatever happened and then to continue to actually provide the same services they did before. And um, it's just a recipe for um, collapse in a way because public officials then tend to contract from themselves and even get defensive. But if you go to them saying, look, we're going to do our part. We are going to do the heavy lift with you. We're going to show you what it is that we need. We're going to provide the data and the evidence and the community support. That's why you're going to come to our meeting. Um, I do think the outcome is dramatically different because at the end of the day, government is made up of people. You know, there is no mythical government. Government is all right. human beings trying to make a system work for the public good. And elected officials are really just people who decided to run for office and we chose between maybe two or three of them. They're not magical. They are actually your representatives and you are you do have a responsibility as the public to actually guide them to where um, what is best for their constituency or to be a, a sane and measured voice in that process. And everybody wants a win. Everyone wants to be able to go home at the end of the day and feel they've made a difference. Our goal as wildfire survivors is to help develop that strategy for our elected officials and our government agencies. For example, uh, we were very concerned after our neighborhood was burnt down that uh, we would get investors coming into the neighborhood to buy lots and then turn those over for Airbnbs, vacation homes. We really wanted to ensure that our community and our neighborhood was going to be allowed to have families again, bring back the families, provide housing for our local workforce. So we worked with our local policymakers to ensure and develop and amend county ordinances that prohibited uh, any additional VRBO or uh, you know, vacation home permits in our fire zone. And that has been extremely successful. But once again, we, we had a concern and we helped develop the solution and the board passed the policy. Yes. And that's, that's what we've done with every issue. But it's important to develop the team of wildfire survivors to work together because numbers do speak volume. And the more voices you have together, the more powerful your message becomes. And really, uh, one of the things that people, you know, we're, this is about how to essentially advocate for your community. And advocate, you really, if you're an advocate, you're also lobbying for a particular um, change in policy or um, something that you think is best for your community. It's not a client, you're not paid as a lobbyist, so to speak, but that is really what the function of advocacy and lobbying is. Yep. One of the other things that Sonoma County did and the city of Santa Rosa was, was dramatically reduce the cost of rebuilding through waiving impact fees. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So immediately after the fire, the, uh, the county met with several several wildfire survivor groups. They knew that we were underinsured. They knew we needed help in rebuilding our homes financially. So they drastically reduced the permitting costs to build our home. What normally would cost probably upwards of sixty to eighty thousand dollars in building permits per home uh, was reduced to about fifty five hundred dollars. So for my home, I paid about $5,500 in permit fees, and that's it. And that was tremendous. I mean, that's money that instantly came back in my pocket to build my house. And it's interesting because a lot of people, you know, equity is a word that's, that is used um, often, 
And um, one of the things we like to say at Rebuild is it's not in our mission to, um, we're, not, we're not a social equity organization, but we do believe in doing equity. And in part of that means, it, part of that requires that you figure out for uh, fire survivors, how are you going to come home? And what can we do as a community to make sure that you're able to come home and reducing those impact fees, working on sewer projects? Like there, those are examples of things that we know are going to save you a lot of money. It's why we liked the fence project because it saved just the perimeter people between 18 and $25,000 each. Yeah. Um, we, one of the reasons why the rebuild and my board and even the funders who came on, we, we really talked to them about how important it is in a post-disaster community to show visual deliverables of progress and hope. And things that so that and so that when, when people would drive past your neighborhood, that they would feel like they were in a way a part of it, that it was a gift from the community, it was a gift from the businesses, it was a yep. gift from you know, Friedman's, I have to just really shout out to Barry Friedman. I mean, he, like we were all subject to the cost of materials post-disaster. And I've seen this repeatedly in other communities that, you know, the, the rumors of the, um, what's going to cost to rebuild, the fluctuations in the lumber market in particular. And um, Barry Friedman actually pre-purchased over $300,000 worth of materials and put them on, he put it on his Windsor lot. And then, um, Obviously we paid that back. Plus he gave a very, uh, he negotiated directly with the mills. And then he gave like another $40,000 to this project, which was ultimately $490,000 at the end. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I, uh, two things just of note is that I found um, very moving is I really, we wanted for all of you to come home and feel like, you know, the community had put its arms around you metaphorically and literally. So that was, I know it's, everyone's like, it's just a fence. I'm like, doesn't, right. didn't feel like just a fence. And when I show that film across the country and when I'm doing speaking engagements, I have seen FEMA, seasoned FEMA people, a room full of 150, 200 of them get weepy over it because they have been on the front lines for so long and yeah. um, they understand and appreciate the struggle and the pain and the trauma and the, um, the, the really how providing hope is actually what makes the difference. And that was our goal. And I'm, I'm so, I mean, obviously you never know if something's going to work. <laughs> That's what I tell everybody, but that. Jennifer, um, generational. It's generational. And I'll tell you why. A new neighbor just bought a house that borders that fence. And I was over there talking to them and they're like, wow, this fence is incredible. And I said, yeah, do you know the story behind this fence? And I told it to them. They were like, wow, that is awesome. That's why we moved here because of this community. So that fence is going to be, what do they say? If those walls could talk, if that fence could talk and it will talk for generations, it's going to tell the story of our rebuild success for years to come. I so, uh, it was, yes, I so appreciate that. It makes me a little like, oh, but I, that's how I genuinely feel about it. And I think my favorite right. thing was, um, I think it was you or Habitat who passed along a letter to us from one of the neighbors who said that they felt for the first time that they got their privacy back. And that was a big deal. Like, cause a lot of people, when this happened, they would, and they didn't, you know, people are well-intentioned but they were driving around and they wanted to see the fire damage but that meant that they were also witnessing a lot of people standing in front of the wreckage of their lives. And, and mourning quite publicly. And um, so I didn't expect that to be one of the bonuses of it, but I guess, it, but it was, and that was really um, moving. So very happy to do that. Well, let's talk about state advocacy. Um, okay. Can you talk to us about some of the ways that um, you've worked with our state representatives? We are very fortunate in this area. We have some fantastic state uh, legislators and staff. Um, how have you used the power of the state or gone along with um, maybe some of the county supervisors who were speaking at the state level in order to advocate what was best for this community, but also to create change, which I think is actually probably, the, it's not even an also, it's one of the most significant accomplishments is to create change for future generate future fire survivors, which came almost immediately. Absolutely. So from day one, uh, after creating our, our Larkfield Resilience Fund nonprofit, we instantly uh, developed relationships uh, with our local state officials, 
We traveled to Sacramento with our block captain network to propose and support insurance regulatory updates. Uh, one successful win there is uh, fire survivors now have uh, three years, not two years like we did, but they now have three years to rebuild their home with their insurance funds. That gives you a little more elbow room to uh, rebuild after a, a massive wildfire. And we did, we absolutely went to the Capitol and lobbied for insurance uh, regulatory, regulatory updates. And we had done a great job in keeping our officials up to date on rebuild efforts three years after the fire. We take our congressional representatives on tours of our rebuild community, including our uh, state and assembly members, and we keep their staff updated. Probably, you know, our elected officials are so darn busy as are their staff, but we've really reached out to their staff, their chief of staff, legislative directors, and made sure that they have the latest figures and facts on our rebuild status so they can incorporate that into any legislative bills that they're working on. And we wanna make sure that they are keenly aware that we're still here and that we're still rebuilding. And there are still issues, there are still concerns, but that we are part of the solution and that we want to be a voice of, of facts. Um, it's one thing to be in Sacramento or Washington, D.C. And, and draft a bill uh, for wildfire survivors, but it's another to actually have the wildfire survivors testifying before committees supporting those bills or reaching out to other legislators in support of those bills. And that's what we're doing right now with the PG&E funds is trying to ensure that even at the local level, our county board of supervisors remain engaged and aware that um, our message is clear. We don't want anyone else having to go through what we just went through. And by for people who are, so some people may not be even in this state or this part of the country. Um, can yeah. you just elaborate a little bit on what the pg e funds are from, how much they are, and what the conflict is in some of the um, competing interests because it is a, it is the age of COVID when we're recording this. Sure. So uh, PG&E was found liable for several of the fires in 2017. Based on that finding, they settled with the County of Sonoma for roughly $150 million for damages occurred because of those fires in 2017. So the County of Sonoma now literally has $150 million cash sitting in their general fund. And it's one-time money. It's one-time money from the 2017 fires. It is our, our hope that uh, that funding gets reinvested in our community to make us more fire safe. And that's where the wildfire survivors, our network is advocating to ensure that money does not get spent elsewhere. For example, um, because that money is unrestricted funds, it's in the general fund, it could easily be used to pay for other community services other than fire safety programs. So our goal in messaging is this money came from the lives lost in 2017 because of wildfires. This money needs to go back into our community to ensure no more lives are lost because of wildfires. Thank you. And fuel mitigation is very, people don't understand Huge. necessarily that a lot of our, so about in Sonoma County, about 80% of our wildlands are privately owned. And the cost of uh, mitigating your fuel load on private property is, is incredibly expensive. Like 2,500 um, bucks an, an acre. Yeah. Uh, yes. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do at Rebuild is fund pilot programs that use actual um, mapping to look at the underneath the canopy at what can be done and to do very targeted fuel mitigation. There's still tremendous cost to that. And there are creative financing mechanisms that could be employed by the county that allow to allow these one-time funds to actually dramatically um, have a much uh, greater um, impact than just, but one of, uh, oh, I froze. Um, one of the things that came up was, you know, immediately like 25 million for fuel mitigation 
And um, we, and then what was it, 50 million for something else? But we asked them to flip that um, formula so that, the, so that the bulk of the funds went into fuel mitigation. Because tell us what's happened since 2017 here in Sonoma County. Yeah, so uh, since 2017, I mean, we have had at least three major wildfires uh, rip through our community. Um, just sitting here in my rebuild, uh, two of those have come one mile from my rebuilt home. And so, yeah, we have experienced, um, I believe, five wildfires in different magnitudes since 2017. And so vegetation management is critical in terms of making generational change and making our community fire safe. And utilizing these funds for long-term investments in vegetation management is huge. You can't just do vegetation management for one year or three years or five years. It's gotta be long-term. And if there's one thing Sonoma County is known for doing nationwide, it's being innovative and creative and be you know, world-class thinkers. And so that's what we're pushing our county to do once again, is take these one-time funds and invest it wisely in a long-term vegetation management plan because we do have these natural corridors where wildfires have erupted several times. The Tubbs fire, uh, that, that wildfire zone, we've had three fires in that same area over the last 50 to 75 years. So there's natural progression in history of knowing where these fires are coming from. Now's the time to invest long-term in slowing, stopping the spread of those wildfires and saving lives. I heard this term when I was in Southern Oregon a couple of months ago called mild fire. And that um, one of the things that we could cu cultivate um, in these fire in these fire affected communities is mild fires as opposed to these mega wildfires. One of the things that for somebody listening to this might say, oh, you know, well, why are you building in the woods, which is really um, what we call a WUI, a wildland urban interface. But what they don't necessarily understand is that these fires don't care about your WUI. Nope. They're going to come where they want to come there. I mean, nope. in this case, the Tubbs fire, it was like, thank you um, for the watershed. I'm just going to rush down nope. this creek. You know, thank you for the highway. That's what it made its own highway through the creeks, rushes down into your area, which uh, was all you were in the flatlands and then yep. took the overpass to the yep. other side of a six lane freeway, snaked around, took out a Kmart and then found an empty lot snaked around and then went out and took out 1400 homes. And so the theory that um, the issue is building, you know, up in the woods is that is not the main issue. The main issue is there's so much fuel uh, and these fires get so big and so hot because of climate change that they make their own weather and they're gonna go their own way. And you can be miles away from any, any hill and you can still have your entire neighborhood decimated. The, the wooey zone is literally uh, a quarter of a mile from my house right now. I mean, I could actually look out my window and see the, the boundary of the wooey area. That didn't make a darn difference uh, the night the tub fire came in. And I uh, couldn't agree with you more. What, 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 what can make a difference, though, is if you have landscape that is properly managed where canopies are driven up you're reducing the fuel load, you're reducing the amount of debris that could be pushed through and wind driven. You know, you're also gonna have to, you know, home hardening is, is critical. Uh, keeping brush and landscape five feet from your house, ensuring you have the proper vents, ensuring you don't have any exposed wood. I mean, even here in the valley floor, yeah, I mean, we're in suburbia here in, in Northern Santa Rosa, and, you know, we rebuilt our home with hardy, hardy board right? So concrete siding. For homes that have not burnt, that were built in the 1970s, it's crucial that you home harden. And that means clearing landscape, ensuring that you have the proper um, devices on your home to make them, make them fire safe. And and I will, and there's you know, a cost to that. That's not huge. free. Like Vulcan vents are not free, but they can save lives. Like Absolutely. So you know, doing those innovative financing models so people can, um, you know, seniors, vulnerable communities, people who just don't have a lot of extra money, which is a lot of people. Sonoma County is a very expensive yep. place to live. 
but it can actually make um, it can make the difference between um, life and death. It is that serious, and this is a one-time opportunity. So, can you talk to us? I know you've done two things in particular in the past couple months to um, lobby, advocate for um, for a safer, uh, more resilient community. What are those two things? So we've decided to use our, our media outlet and social media to deliver our message and advocate uh, for vegetation management funding. So we uh, partnered up with the Rebuild North Bay Foundation who helped us get an ad, a full page ad in our local newspaper, the Press Democrat. And it was an open letter. It was an open letter to our county leadership and to our community. And it was signed by wildfire survivors and block captains from throughout the county. And that open letter basically just helped deliver our message. We also then followed that up uh, again with the Rebuild North Bay Foundation support in producing a, a short documentary. We wanted to take our stories, our real life stories, and show people what does vegetation management mean? What does that look like? What can that actually do? I mean, there's so much talk about it, but no one really truly knows unless you're living in the hills or you've been through this, what it means. So we took a film crew up, we interviewed four wildfire survivors who each have their own different story on how weed whacking, pruning trees, home hardening, uh, you know, putting copper flashing on your eaves can save your house from a wildfire and can provide the access needed for Cal Fire or your firefighters to come in and save your home, but better yet, provide you the opportunity to save your own life and get out of a wildfire if you're ever trapped in one at your home. So it's worked out very well. Um, I think it's going viral, I think, on social media, uh, the documentary. And I believe that our message has been heard because as Jennifer alluded to, uh, you know, the board has so far uh, given $25 million for vegetation management. And I believe they're gonna give more uh, in the next few weeks. And I think some people might be like, well, you know, Brad, you work at the county or, you know, this is why they listened, but it's actually harder if you work at the county. Yeah. Um, it's a bigger risk to take because you are really lobbying your local board of supervisors. Now, Rebuild North Bay normally doesn't do that because we are, we partner with them. But in this case, because it was a request from fire survivors, then uh, we were happy to not only support you, but we, this is a side note, if you're looking at how to advocate, we put all of that funding into our um, advocacy bucket so that when we did our taxes at the end of the year, it would, did not go into a grant. It went into instead advocacy. Because um, you have to be very mindful of that as a nonprofit. But it can be way crunchier when you when you know the people and you work with them and and, and they are effect, in effect your bosses. So it takes a little bit of courage for you for you to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, but you know what? At the end of the day, we all live this tragedy together, and I know we all want the same outcome. And it takes leadership, and someone has to step up and say. Let's do this. This is what should be done. You know, there's the old adage, right? If you're not at the table, you're on it. And I would much rather be at it, even if it's with my own employer. And I will leverage every relationship that I have to make this community more fire safe. It is every obligation, I think, of every Sonoma County resident. We cannot and should not let our community down and go through another wildfire and lose another life. That should be our mission. That should be our goal. And I, I don't know who wouldn't agree with that. And you're right. If not you, then who? That's in, in any fire, in any disaster affected community. Um, if you have undergone it, then you have the right and the obligation yep. and the responsibility to step up and be part of the solution to uh, be able to work with people, but also to be, um, some, you know, a little bit brave. It takes a little bit of being brave. And sometimes um, that's a hard thing to do, but it is always worth it if you know that at the end of the day, you're going to have saved more lives, um, saved more homes, and um, led to a better, stronger, safer community. So I am just a huge fan. Grant, you know, I just love working with you. And I, 
I like uh, watching what you're doing and um, it's a pleasure. And can you actually end this podcast on your best advice for anybody who's all of a sudden woken up today or two weeks ago and they've picked this podcast to listen to um, this episode because they want to know how to advocate for their community and fire survivors? What's your best advice? My best advice to survive after a disaster and rebuild after a disaster is to follow your heart, your intuition, the relationships that you've built and protect your community and your family. And if that means advocating at the state level for regulations, if that means picking up a video camera and creating a documentary on vegetation management. If that means feeling uncomfortable, but knowing that your message needs to be heard, do it. You are a wildfire survivor. You are part of an unfortunate club that owes it to the next generation to ensure they don't go through and they don't have to feel the stress and pain that you have felt work for them to ensure they never have to go through what we've just experienced. I think that's a perfect place to end. Thank you so much again for being on How to Disaster, Brad Sherwood. Thank you, Jennifer. And again, thank you to the Rebuild North Bay Foundation. Thank you for joining us on How to Disaster, a playbook to recover, rebuild, and reimagine. I wanna leave you with this one thought. Thank you for spending your time with us. And we want you to know that you can get through this. You can recover, rebuild, and reimagine. But there's only one way you're going to do it. And that's together. <laughs>